Wrestling fans, our ninth annual Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive is kicking off with an early, unexpected bang as recent WWE NXT Cruiserweight Champion Leo Rush will be joining us live Thursday, November the 5th here at MWF Studios in downtown Melrose, Massachusetts, the zip code of champion 02176. A lot has been said about Leo while he was with WWE. A lot has been said about Leo since he was released by WWE during the coronavirus outbreak in April. We'll be taping a special Wrestling Insider Rush Hour miniseries to let Leo tell his story his way. At 8 p.m. that night, we'll be going live around the corner and around the world for a special cyber autograph signing where you can get a personalized autograph photo from Leo sent directly to your home. For complete information, visit bostonwrestling.com. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Lorndorf. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, welcome to another bonus edition of Wrestling Insider's Current Events, podcast style, where we break down AEW Dynamite from Daly's Place in Jacksonville, Florida, as well as WWE NXT from the Capitol Wrestling Center in Orlando, Florida, from Wednesday, October the 28th, 2020. Speaking of that date, we certainly want to thank all of the great fans that made October 28th the biggest day in the history of Boston Wrestling's YouTube channel. Really cool. We broke a record that was actually set just in September. But again, a cool feeling when you put so much work into bringing you so many weekly productions for your wrestling viewing pleasures. As Boston Wrestling Sports Chairman Neil Manolian tackles the issues with our live wrestling events down at Memorial Hall, the biggest thing all of us can do with the video productions right now is simple. Share, 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 like one of Reno Chastain's meals, The Price is Right, it's free. Share the links to our programs on social media, via text, via email. Yell out the window at socially safe distances if you have to. Give the videos a big thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to the channel to enjoy over 2,000 free videos. Our credo continues to be simple. Keep wrestling legends working. Many of them have gone seven or eight months now without live wrestling events to wrestle on, autograph signings to sign at. They need our help. We're getting closer and closer by the day, thanks to great wrestling fans like you. I promised you a huge November and December. Big news is breaking across the board. In regards to the ninth annual Paul Bear Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive, as noted due to coronavirus, we cannot bring you a live wrestling event this year, but, but, from November the 5th through December the 13th, we have a literal plethora of superstars coming to MWF Studios in downtown Melrose, Massachusetts, the zip code of champion 02176 for a cyber fan fest. We'll have live episodes galore, merchandise, raffles, cyber autograph signings, and more. It all begins this coming Thursday, November the 5th at 8 p.m. when recent WWE NXT Cruiserweight champion Leo Rush returns to this fine studio for the first time in five years to tape Wrestling Insiders Rush Hours, the miniseries, then meet and greet with you online. A lot was said about Leo while he was with WWE. A lot has been said since WWE gave him the axe along with 30 or so other superstars in April due to the coronavirus. This is going to be Leo's platform to tell his story his way. We're expecting to release the entire roster of Super and Future Stars. By the time you're hearing this episode, head on over to bostonwrestling.com for complete information. We have two all-inclusive VIP packages available, as well as individual autographs from each of the superstars coming to the studio. We're going to do everything we can to honor our friend Paul Bearer as we help update Santa Claus's GPS to find every kid's house this week. Christmas. Can we even get away with saying the C word anymore? I don't know. I mentioned the C word on John Cena Sr.'s talk show. 
He thought I meant a four-letter version. I did not. I meant Christmas. If you missed Wrestling Insider's party with Marty at 9 p.m. tonight, as Marty Jannetty continued to shoot on his early days in the WWF in 1988, talking a little Harley Race, B. Brian Blair, Nikolai Volkoff, the Iron Sheik, the Junkyard Dog, have no fear, Marty's no-holds-barred sex, drugs, and rock and roll look into 80s and 90s wrestling is available in the archives at the conclusion of this episode for your viewing pleasure. Don't forget that tomorrow night, when the lights go out at the Thunderdome at the Amway Center in Orlando, Florida for SmackDown, things are just beginning with John Cena Cena's Dome. That's right. This week on Wrestling Inside is Fabulous Friday. Johnny shoots on the news coming out of the WWE Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, including Drew McIntyre losing the WWE Championship. Randy Orton, the tribal chief at the head of the table. No, not Pete Tringali. Roman Reigns, Jey Uso, and more. Join Mr. Cena every Friday night at 10 p.m. for a brand new episode. If you've had enough politics, WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas is back with us election night Tuesday, November the 3rd at 9 p.m. where he shoots on a tale of two Kamalas, managers, and more. No matter what you do at the ballot box, we hope you'll vote to be with us for Wrestling Insiders at your house Tuesday at 9. Along with our three weekly in-studio shoot interview talk shows, our three television review podcasts, Wrestling Insiders flashback videos, we've got special episodes online right now with WWE Hall of Famer Brutus the Barber Beefcake, pay-per-view watch-alongs, and so much more. Don't forget that on Survivor Series Sunday, November the 22nd, Vicky Guerrero joins us in studio for the very first time, as always, we're interested in your thoughts on AEW and NXT this week. What did you think of the show? We hope the whole gang is here for the live premiere, chatting away. Slick Rick B up in Maine, Tina, Maria Davis, Trigger Trey, Ken, all of the various Kevins that join us, Big Ant from Thunder Valley, Will Cortez, Lass, and all of the regulars we enjoy hanging out with. Whether you're watching the live premiere with us tonight at 10 or in the archives, share your thoughts on the two show shows using a 1 to 10 scale, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, so we know what you think. Let's give our friends a few minutes to join us for the live premiere, sneak in a couple of cheap plugs, if you will, if you want early Add free access to all of our Wrestling Insiders in-studio shoot interviews, our world-renowned studio shoot interview DVD series, and to simply help keep wrestling legends working, join our growing family over on Patreon, patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling, forgo a Starbucks coffee, and enjoy what I believe is now close to, if not more, than 100 programs. You'll never have the pro wrestling blues with Boston Wrestling Sports. I believe the next six Episodes of Wrestling Insiders are available now, along with the Patreon-exclusive episode with Marty Jannetty you'll never find on YouTube. A big goal of ours before the end of 2020 that I know we can hit with so many great folks listening is to have 100 regular Patreons. With the quality, the quantity of the shows we produce, I'm confident we can get the job done. With so much going on, I could easily go for one of those energy drinks filled with sugar, but what I really need is a couple of hits of Boost Oxygen, where from a matter of seconds, I go from Quincy Rustani to Bob Snow, alert and ready to compete on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek if I had to. If you haven't tried Boost Oxygen yet, you should. It's available at fine retailers everywhere, as well as BoostOxygen.com. Whether you enjoyed NXT and AEW last night and want to create a little WWE mayhem of your own, or... Feel you could do better than the creative teams at hand? The brand new WWE 2K Battlegrounds game is available now. For complete information, head on over to wwe.2k.com backslash battlegrounds. Little Marathi, our junior ambassador, Devon Brent, says it's the best WWE video game that's been released over the past few years. And believe me, just take a look at my credit card statements. He knows his video games. Check it out. If you want to know where I can find him a PS5 for Christmas... Hook a brother up. The, the DMs are open. Slide on in. With the holidays coming up, it's never too early to start shopping at our eBay store. Link available in the comment sections below. We have an awesome collection of rare autograph wrestling memorabilia for sale that includes video shout-out thank yous from WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas on Wrestling Insiders itself. Plus, Tony has his commissioned artwork available, prints, personal phone calls, 
cameo-style videos, autographs, and more. Tony's story is a tough one. His wife had a stroke in June of 2019. She's been hospitalized ever since. Since coronavirus began, Tony is out of work with wrestling appearances, as well as his job as a personal trainer. It's no good. We want to help out Mr. USA all that we can. Finally, we have a really cool WWE t-shirt bundle fundraiser going on over at bostonwrestling.com backslash shirts dot html for the regular price of a t-shirt on wwe shop we give you not only the shirt but you get a wwe cup you also get a mystery autograph photo and again you get that on-air shout out from tony atlas thanking you for being a great human being how about that we got some great brand new shirts right now of bray wyatt the undisputed era roman reigns John Cena, Hulk Hogan, The Macho Man, Randy Savage, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The New Day, The New World Order, and tons more. Help our shows stay on the air. Get yourself some new swag. With that said, joining me now to break down AEW and NXT, Southwestern Connecticut's finest, Mr. Matt Degnan. All right, Matt, what a night it was. Or maybe what a night it wasn't. I guess that's up to the viewer's interpretation. I know I'm excited about the big live episode we have next Thursday with recent WWE NXT Cruiserweight Champion Leo Rush. That's a different story for a different time. But tonight, a little AEW, a little NXT. Which one are we going to talk about first? NXT. Halloween Havoc. All is. right. Well, hold on then. See, you know what? You throw a curveball at me. You get my notes all discombobulated. All right. All right. Whenever you're ready, sir. Well, I don't watch NXT that much, but since it was Halloween Havoc, I figured, you know what? I'll give them a shot. Um, and they didn't really do Jeez, too you're much. you're all hot. That. You're all hot. You did them a big favor. Yeah. And they didn't do too much with that shot I gave well, them. Let, so I think let's it's, talk uh, Halloween Havoc then. I got to hear this. To open NXT Halloween Havoc inside the Capitol Wrestling Center, Johnny Gargano defeated Damian Priest in a Devil's Playground match to become the new North American champion of NXT. I thought it was a very good opening match that set the tone for the night. Uh, if people are questioning what the rules were for this Devil's Playground match, it was basically a Falls Count Anywhere match. Just a little Halloween twist to it. Gargano did have help from a masked assailant who assisted him in winning the match after he handed Gargano a tombstone to hit Priest off the stage and then pinned him on the floor to achieve his second reign with the North American title. What did you think of this opening match? Oh, let me tell you, I, 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 being the Halloween lover that I am, I was looking forward to at least checking out NXT's version of Halloween Havoc, even if it wouldn't be the extravaganza of WCW's 1990 pay-per-view offerings. Uh, with many blockbusters from the MGM in Las Vegas, Nevada, I thought it had a cool opening to the show, and then it just kind of went downhill. Um... As soon as Beth Phoenix started squealing when Gargano popped the blow-up pumpkin, it reminded me why. Uh, most weeks, I think NXT has the better show, but it's why nine out of ten times I watch AEW live because at least the soundtrack doesn't make me want to rip my ears out. She's just terrible. She takes away from the quality of the show. Uh, as I've said before, I hate Gargano as a heel. It's not believable. Uh, the size difference to this match was kind of uh, like the spin the wheel, make the deal gimmick WCW. I'll never forget they made the mistake of not uh, actually gimmicking uh, the wheel, which actually led to the horrible sting and Jake the Snake Roberts match in 1992, um, where they wound up with a coal miners glove match out of all the possibilities that there were on the wheel. WCW actually went shoot. They didn't want anyone to know, including the wrestlers, what the match was going to be until they spun that wheel. We got a Devil's Playground match, um, which no one took the time to explain what it was. As usual, they just happened to be one of those kendo sticks under the ring. Uh, <laughs> and I will continue to complain why on earth are the kendo sticks under professional wrestling rings. Just another one of those small things that people with an ounce of common sense look at and think, why would there be a kendo stick under a wrestling ring? If they've seen it multiple times, they really roll their eyes. How about using things under a wrestling ring that might be actually used to build the wrestling ring? I don't know. Why would you want actually, to do that? Now that I'm thinking of it, I don't think I ever told you this. I have the tip of a kendo stick sitting on my desk here. 
I'm, I'm really impressed by that. I, yeah, thank I don't you. know fully, why. Why do you have the tip of a kendo stick sitting on your desk? It flew into the crowd at a show, and I caught it. So I kept it. That's unbelievable. What a story. I mean, that, <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's better than the huh? tip of something else on your desk, but that's a different story for a different time. You'd have to talk like to Mr. Sacco. Talk to Saj Russo's uh, her little... Uh, for little texting friends, that's a different story for a different time. But you had the Broken Arrow suplex across the announce table. Again, can they go one show without using an announcer's table? I remember the first time Diesel, Kevin Nash, powerbomb Shawn Michaels through the announcer's table. It in your house, April 1996, and I thought it was the coolest thing. Now it's done sometimes multiple times per week, and nobody cares. <laughs> Match went on. They had someone in a scream mask come out. Uh, just after Pat McAfee was in a mask a week or two ago, attacked Damian Priest up on that big platform with a little Ed Ketter action with the pipe. The masked man gave Gargano an actual tombstone, I guess a, a pretty light tombstone, but a tombstone nonetheless to break over Priest's head. He went flying onto some gimmicked platform. One, two, three, new champion. No. Impressed? Right. I was no. not. I like no. the decor. I think they did a nice job with that, with the ambiance. I think they did a nice job with that. As far as the content of the match goes, I, I don't know why it wasn't even explained what it was. Uh, they just kind of mentioned it as they went along. And how did the wrestlers know what the rules of the match were, you know? The bell just rang, and they automatically knew what the stipulations were going to be. They must have had a Bill Belichick-sized playbook with the rule to every match on the wheel before Unless the show started. I was going to say, at least the announcers could say, oh, the wrestlers know what each stipulation is going to be, you know, before the match so they could prepare for each one of them. Give it a little so, credibility, as we like yeah. to call it, a little credibility. And I, to heighten the unpredictability of the wheel, they could say they prepared for each match on the wheel or just something like that, that, you know, maybe give the fans a little realistic, you know, integrity of the show. But I guess we can't even do that in 2020, among no, other things. absolutely not. No. Uh, the next segment, which I do have actually a lot of notes for, not good. Uh, Pat McAfee with the new NXT Tag Team Champions, Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch, cut a promo about their feud with Undisputed Era. For those who don't know, McAfee said on his social media that he paid off Ridge Holland to attack Adam Cole a few weeks ago. They tried to explain this story more in depth, but it was just all over the place, and it was just way too much talking. The way he was just telling the story, it, he talked way too quick for way too long. Way and too long. The story was just all over the place. He was saying one thing, then he's going to another. He was just darting all over the place. It's like someone shot him in the ass with some adrenaline. Uh, I don't think Pat McAfee should be on WWE TV, whether it's a host, announcer, definitely not a wrestler. Any Anything with WWE, he should not be involved. Kyle O'Reilly then comes out to confront them with help from a returning Pete Dunn, eh, but not so quick as Pete Dunn smashes a chair in O'Reilly's back and gets attacked by all four men. I really don't get this segment. I have a couple questions that I wanted answered or want them answered next week was why was Dunn with Kyle? Why would Kyle bring him in if it was a surprise and no one knew? Then how did Pat know Pete was coming back? So how did he contact him to join him if it was supposed to be a surprise, you know, well, I'm going to guess that Kyle was all alone. And he said, I need some backup. So he made a but call over is, to England. And he sent over Vince's plane. Then but, with whatever amount of money he offered, Dunn said, well, you know what? Pat McAfee's around now. Let me see what he's got financially. And then he called Pat and Pat said, all right, I'll double it. So he said, but when we're going to do is you're going to come out after Kyle. And when he's not looking, hit him with the chair, then I'll give you the money and we'll triple team him. I have no idea. That's just a, an uneducated guess. And why would Pete join Kyle O'Reilly? Maybe it was the money. I, I, I don't know. Was there but any how many, money? I don't how, know. I don't how know. Many, how many storylines in NXT are we going to have right now about people paying off people to help them? Well, masked men. Yeah, masked men. <laughs> Um, having people outside the ring, giving you brass knuckles, paying off Rich Holland, paying off Pete Dunn. How much help do people need in NXT so they can get over or the, lack thereof? There are more uh, masks in NXT right now than you do on seeing old people at the grocery store. Well, I guess they're living the gimmick. Uh, he doesn't have issues with Undisputed Era. 
He hasn't had issues with Undisputed Era since April 7, 2018, when Roderick Strong turned on him to join the Undisputed Era. The storyline just doesn't add up, and it is very random. Only maybe it was to- about the money, and I don't even know if there was any money involved. But maybe. But I, I don't know. They never explained that, though. I'm just saying these are things I want explained instead of just, oh, you know, he joined our group. You know, I have more questions I need answered. All right, well. Why would it take this long, and why take out Kyle O'Reilly instead of Roderick Strong, who turned on him over two years ago? And where was the rest of the group to help? You have four guys in a group. One is injured. Where's O'Reilly and Strong? And you know, and why would Kyle bring in Pete if he has the other two to help him? You know, why would he pay him off when he has two healthy competitors? You know, waiting in the back. You'd have unless, to talk with Doctor David Race. Maybe he could break it down psychologically. Unless they're part of the recent COVID outbreak this past week in NXT, and then they could be there. I can't see why Fish and Strong weren't out there. Unless they had to quarantine. But it, uh, this just looks like we're going to get another War Games match between uh, Undisputed Era and, somebody, and then Pat, Mac- yeah. Pat, Pat McAfee and his three goons. Uh, it just seems very, very forced and out of nowhere. Uh, to me, it's not entertaining. I don't care for Pat McAfee. Birch and Lorkin, they're not top-tier guys to put in a War Games match against Undisputed Era. And Undisputed Era themselves, I've had enough of. They've been in every single War Games match since 2017, I believe. It's just overkill with them, and it's just it has no storyline backing to me and nothing I can buy into. What do you think about it? Well, I, I have no issues with the new tag team champions. I'm a big Oni Larkin guy. He competed here in Boston Wrestling, the Millennium Wrestling Federation. Uh, Danny Birch is a solid hand. I don't know if I'd feature them as uh, the, the faces of NXT, but... Pat McAfee, he's an unlikable heel, but he doesn't have the I want to see the good guy beat the hell out of him type heat. He has the heat that says I want to change the channel to AEW. There's just nothing appealing about the guy. Um, It was good to see Pete Dunback. I'm a a big fan of his. I enjoy his wrestling an awful lot. It was kind of a quick heel turn that didn't make a heck of a lot of sense as of this moment, but Maybe there's more than meets the eye. Maybe Pat is, uh, he's got big plans for NXT. I don't know why. I still wish they never involved him in the show, but you know what? As I like to say, they didn't call and ask me for my opinion before they did it. So I I apologize to those. I guarantee you my opinion would have been stated if it was asked for. I mean, that's why I want these things answered. I don't want them to come into the show next week and be like, oh, we're a group now and we're going to face Undisputed Era next week. You know, I want just Pat McAfee or Pete Dunn, someone to come out and explain why Pete was coming out with Kyle when he has other people in his faction to help him, why Pat McAfee knew about Pete Dunn coming in. So that means, I don't know, there's just, it, way too many moving parts and just keep it simple. And no one but, wants him moving. No. And, and in some cases, they don't even want the pots. Yeah. The next match, Cruiserweight Champion Santos Escobar defeated Jake Atlas, not to be confused with Tony Atlas. No, certainly not. And in a non-title match, it was short and to the point. The match was all it needed to be for Santos Escobar. What did you think about it? Solid match. Escobar gets the W with the assist from his heel stable, which is why you have a heel stable. I think Jake Atlas is a, a, a solid little worker. I think Escobar is a good cruiserweight champion. My only nitpicking would be I'd like to see Wild go back to being the DJZ that he was uh, in TNA, where he had much more color and personality and would have much more of a chance at, at selling merchandise and getting over with the fan base. I think WWE is missing the boat. Impact Wrestling, for whatever reason, is very willing to just give the gimmicks away to other wrestling companies if they want them, as we saw with Matt Hardy. And I, I would do that with, with DJZ. But that, again, that's just one man's opinion. The match itself, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Much like I did seeing before the match, Michael Hayes showing up in his pumpkin-colored outfit for and a little the, cameos. They had, the, 
they had the camera microphones turned up so much that you couldn't even hear what he was saying. And I did note that, too. I said, you couldn't really understand what was being said. I didn't want to knock poor Michael PSAs, one of the better promos of the 80s and 90s, but you need to have the microphone on if you want to understand what he's being said. But good to see The next segment I know both of us really didn't like, The Haunted House of Terror oh. with Cameron Grimes and Dexter Loomis where nobody ended up winning, and it said to be continued later in the show, which huh, didn't even need to be done in the first place, but I guess let's give it two segments. I wasn't interested or entertained by this at all. It felt like another House of Horrors match like they did with Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton back in 2017, which I also did not care for. Um, I already think I know what you're going to say about this, but what did you think? It, it did not work with Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt in 2017. It did not work here at all. It was even worse. Uh, if it didn't have the background music and the multiple camera cuts, maybe it would have been a little bit more appealing, but it, it just it got so bad I couldn't believe what was on the screen. It, it had no place on a professional wrestling show, Halloween or otherwise. It, it, uh, I felt tricked because this certainly was not a treat. <laughs> oh, there we go. What are you going to be for Halloween? Kind. Kind, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next match, Rhea Ripley defeated Raquel Gonzalez. I don't have too many notes from this match other than I thought it was a solid women's match. Um, two of the few women in all of women's professional wrestling that do look the part of actual wrestlers, and you can't really say that much for even the men. Um, these look like two real women that can actually beat the shit out of some of the men on the road. As opposed to those fake women, yeah. That, look, as you say, look like cosplay. Cosplay uh, wrestling, yeah. yeah. What did you think of these two behemoths? Uh, going it, at it, it reminded me of Andre and Stud from WrestleMania 1. It was so good. No, I, <laughs> it was much better than the standard women's match. I thought it was a very solid effort by both of them. If more women's matches were like this, I don't think I'd mind the women's matches as much as I do. I thought it was a little long, but other than that, it, it, it was a good showcase for them. The next segment, the Haunted House of Terror, continued inside the Capitol Wrestling Center instead of the creepy house they used before. Um, the reason this second part happened in the center instead of uh, the, the creepy house was because Cameron Grimes ran from that house to the Capitol Wrestling Center. Loomis then makes Grimes pass out with his finished finishing submission submission move if i can get it out um i don't know what the move is called i kind of forget but they never put it over uh they had zombies in this match and i guess all of them came from the house all the way down to the performance center and i don't know how but i guess grimes ran from there and they never disclosed where this location was um what did you think of the continuation of this awful Match, I guess you could say, even though there was no referee involved. As my note said, zombies, lots of nonsense, not for me. Not for you. Why is that? Because it was atrocious. It did not belong on a wrestling TV show, Halloween or otherwise. Was it scarier than Halloween itself? No. I was oh. not scared. I wasn't just wanted it. Enough. I really wanted it to end at this point. It wasn't spooky enough? No. It was not spooky. The main event of the night, Io Shirai defeated Candice LeRae in a tables, ladders, and scares match to become the new NXT Women's Champion. Oh, no, wait, still be. All right. I thought Candice LeRae was going to win, so I had it pre-typed, so I didn't <laughs> I didn't fix the whole thing. I'm surprised they didn't have Candice LeRae win. They knocked they had, your socks off, literally. They're still not on. Right. And, you know, you have Johnny Gargano win in the beginning of the night, and almost everybody thought Candice LeRae was going to take the title and have the husband and wife couple walk out with the titles. I mean, even before the show started, everybody thought both of them were going to win. I but guess I was the only one that didn't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, Io Shirai retains her title. Uh, they put that title, I'll tell you, they put that title above the ring pretty quick, almost immediately when they announced <laughs> the stipulation of the match, the title was above the ring. They announced the matches, tables, ladders, and scares. They go back to the ring, and the title's already above the ring. I mean, talk about it being telegraphed and gimmick, what the wheel was going to say. I mean, at least go back to the ring and put the title 
you know, above the ring. And then they already have ladders and tables and stuff like that under the ring. Well, maybe they should have spun it to open the show or something like that. Uh, Yeah, that would have been better. I mean, almost immediately when that wheel stopped, the title (laughs) was above the, I don't know, just little things like that kind of make me angry. As I went to broadcasting school, and it just doesn't all go with the continuity of the show. Um, Again, I'm surprised Johnny and Candace didn't hold the titles at the end of the night. Um, Seems like that was the way they were going. But I am glad they caught me off guard and surprised me, which they do not do a lot. They did it just for you. They They heard you on the podcast. They said it was coming. It was going to be a Gigano championship family. And they said, you know what? We're going to show them. We're going to show him, even with his new wrestling socks he got when he was away looking at leaves. I mean, I'm glad they surprised me. They usually don't surprise me a lot, and I'm glad they did. What did you think of the main event? I thought it was a better women's match as well. I, I thought it was a hell of an effort from both of the ladies. I really didn't care for the match or who was in it, but you know what? I cannot deny effort when someone puts that much effort into it. You know, they went out there and really put their bodies on the line for that match. I tip my cap to them. Well, would you give a grade for NXT as I gave it a 6 out of 10? I thought it was a pretty solid show. Um, I just buried expect- everything on the show and said there was nothing you liked, but you gave it a 6, a six out of 10. I love it. There's nothing that I didn't like. I liked right. the opening. Ma- the well, only we we were I pretty close. We were pretty close. The only thing I didn't like was the Pat McAfee thing and the Haunted House of Terror. I think... Um, the only those are the only two things I didn't like, and those really only took up 20, 20, 25 minutes of the show, maybe a half hour. But when three fourths of the show is pretty much watchable or around that area, I give it a solid six out of ten. No, well, I was I was kind of close, but there there was a lot of the show I didn't like. When the women's matches are more appealing to me than the men's, you know, it's a rough night at the office. Again, I applaud the effort. I like the ambiance. I love the Halloween decor. I'm a big Halloween guy. But to me, it just didn't come together as a solid wrestling event. I give it only 5 out of 10. I was leaning towards 5. Yeah. But I bumped it up to a 6 because I was generous. Because I didn't expect it to be as good as I thought it was going to be. And they did a little bit better than I thought. So I said, all right, you know, worthy of a 6. Especially the set and the mood of the night also helped that as well. So the I Halloween decorations put it over the edge for you. I think not like the 1999 pay-per-view, but I really thought, you know, they bought into the whole set and the feel of the night, which I thought they did a solid night. Only two things really turned me away, and I thought for, you know, WWE wrestling, I thought that's only two segments is good for them. One little news and notes section here. Oh. Em- Ember Moon versus Dakota Kai and Tommaso Ciampa versus Velveteen Dream were both announced for next week. All I can really say to that is... Good luck. Can't wait to have Leo Rush with us live in the studio Thursday night, November the 5th, 8 p.m., as we get ready to tape our Wrestling Insiders Rush Hour, the miniseries. Yeah. Do you want to take a break here? Absolutely, wrestling fans. Right now, we're going to take a brief timeout. We're getting ready for the ninth annual Paul Bear Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive. We implore you to head on over to bostonwrestling.com. Get the scoops on the superstars coming to the studio. November 5th through December 13th is going to be out of control. Stand by. We'll be back to talk AEW in just a moment. Wrestling fans, our ninth annual Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive is kicking off with an early, unexpected bang as recent WWE NXT Cruiserweight Champion Leo Rush will be joining us live Thursday, November the 5th here at MWF Studios in downtown Melrose, Massachusetts, the zip code of champion 02176. A lot has been said about Leo while he was with WWE. A lot has been said about Leo since he was released by WWE during the coronavirus outbreak in April. We'll be taping a special Wrestling Insider Rush Hour miniseries to let Leo tell his story his way. At 8 p.m. that night, we'll be going live around the corner and around the world for a special cyber autograph signing where you can get a personalized autograph photo from Leo sent directly to your home. For complete information, visit bostonwrestling.com. All right, wrestling fans, welcome back to Wrestling Insider's current edition podcast style. As we look at WWE NXT and now 
AEW Dynamite from October the 28th, 2020. Um, I watched this one live from the comforts of Marathi Hill. I had NXT on the DVR. Uh, I don't know if fans can hear that beeping on my phone. Can you hear the beeping? No. Yeah, all right, well, that's good. It says potential spam on the phone. So I certainly cannot interrupt this project for potential spam. But let's kick it off from Daly's Place, Jacksonville, Florida. Prodigy, what do we got? Opening a pre-taped AEW Dynamite, Hangman Adam Page defeated Wardlow to advance the finals and the number one contenders tournament for the AEW title. Um, I'm glad we can finally see two guys who looked apart wrestle each other and make it look real. Almost like they wanted, as you say, to hurt each other. Um, you know, you really don't see that as much in any of professional wrestling. And even highlighting AEW is they're one of the companies that have a lot of guys that don't really look the part. Or as you say, guys are kind of green and not ready yet for TV. Um, I thought it was a great opening to the show um, compared to what was else, you know, the other things on the show. Uh, oh, someone's using their horn outside my house. Um what did you think of this opening match? Well, I was a little rolling the eyes a bit with the promo that opened the show in the back with MJF and Guevara saying yeah. that uh, MJF saying Guevara looks like he sells Adderall to middle schoolers. Um, is it a, the tension is growing between the two of them over the five XL jacket that Quincy gladly would have taken last week that, um, MJF gave to the inner circle. MJF said that if Wardlow won the title, that it would be his, his property. I thought we were going to see a, a reenactment of Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant from the main event on NBC in February of 1988. That was not meant to be. Hangman Page and Wardlow, they went out there. They had a solid match. Uh, it, it was intense. It felt like they were out there wrestling, like they were fighting for a reason. If I was WWE, he might be the number one guy in that company. I'd be waiting for the contract to expire, send him down to the PC to train, give him some NXT to work, and then make him an impact player on one of the main rosters. Uh, Raw or SmackDown for a long time to come. I was impressed with this match. I enjoyed it much more than the opening match on NXT. The next match I didn't really enjoy that much. Eddie Kingston defeating Matt Seidel. The match was a little too long for someone who was about to challenge for the AEW title. You know, you had Kingston... Not really struggling with Seidel, but I mean, if he's gonna, if he's gonna have Seidel challenge him, what's gonna happen when he faces um, John Moxley for the AEW title in an I Quit match in just a few weeks or next week at Full Gear? So I mean, I thought it was a little too long for the next challenger for the biggest title in the company. What did you think of this match? Well. Same as my notes have stated pretty much all along with Kingston. Good promo, not a very good ring presentation. Matt Seidel looks good. He proves uh, time in, time out that he belongs in a major league wrestling ring. We were very happy to have him here in Boston wrestling the MWF back in December when he took on TJP. Eddie Kingston goes over clean. I understand the need to send Kingston into full gear hot where he's in the title match against John Moxley, but... Uh, if I had the pencil, that wouldn't have been the guy I would have selected to go over no. and push in the company. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I would try and do something with Seidel. I think there's a lot more long-term value in him than any Kingston. He might not be the promo that Kingston is, but other than that verbal, there isn't much. I, even they're billing Seidel at 166 pounds, unless I heard that wrong. that's Really? What, 166 it, pounds? Wow. Unless Justin Roberts got it wrong. 166 is what I heard. I mean, I, I'll go back and listen to it, and I'll text you. But yeah, we really I need to get to the bottom of this. I, I, but it's just you're going to have Eddie Kingston, who looks like he hasn't touched a weight or a treadmill in his life, and you know, who's got a little bit of a gut to him. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just, and you have him go up against, you know, a tiny guy, Matt Seidel. I really, th I've said this before. I really, really think the AEW needs some type of cruiserweight division. Some of the guys on this roster just are not big enough to compete with guys like Eddie Kingston, Wardlow, Omega, Page, um, Cody, you know, Brody Lee, you know, Chris Jericho, MJF. There's a lot of bigger guys. So and then you look at guys like, you know, like Jungle Boy, um, what's it, Orange Cassidy, Darby Allen, Matt Seidel. They have a lot of smaller guys in the company. So I think they would really benefit 
from having a cruiserweight division. But as you always say, they didn't call me. So we'll move into the next segment. Excalibur interviewed the AEW Tag Team Champions FTR and the ta- challengers, the Young Bucks. I thought it was a good segment to help build their AEW Tag Title match at full gear on November 7th, which we will be doing a watch along in MWF Studios. Live. Next, live next live. Saturday. Well, yeah, live next Saturday. Live. Um, I, I like adding fuel to the fire and um, layers being added to big feuds. Uh, this match um, is something that a lot of people have been looking forward to in the wrestling community uh, for a while now. The Young Bucks say if they lose at full gear, then they will never challenge for the AEW tag titles ever again. Uh, um, I'm not a big fan of this. Since Cody did it not that long ago, so it doesn't really seem that fresh or new since it was already done just last year in the company. And it's a fairly new company. So, I mean, it's not like they've been around for five, six years where they can get away with duplicating gimmicks and stipulations and stuff like that. So, I mean, when he just did the thing for the AEW um, world title saying, oh, if I lose, I'll never challenge for it again, da 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 and now they're doing it just a few months, not even a year later. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of it. What do you think? I, I wasn't a fan of this at all. The Excalibur dressed up like a piece of garbage. I don't understand why he wears the mask. I don't like that. I think it takes away from his credibility. Uh, again, as you noted, Young Bucks, they needlessly said if they didn't beat FTR, they'll never challenge for the titles again. Just like when Cody needlessly said it last year, to overbook his title match. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, Storyline-wise, let company officials decide who gets title shots. Let company officials decide when someone doesn't get one. Let heel champions put together (laughs) stipulations like this, not renegade baby faces that only castrate themselves if they lose. I I didn't like that at all. I'm not a fan of the 97 DX Young Bucks, but that's just me. Just you. The next segment, there is a town hall with MJF and Chris Jericho in which they discuss MJF joining the inner circle. The segment, I guess, had to be moderated by two people and Tony Schiavone and Dasha Corette, I guess how you say it. She was Dasha, I think, Fuentes or something like that in WWE. In this segment, the two superstars took questions and thoughts from other talent in AEW. I thought it was just... Another goofy segment that was not entertaining to me. Uh, it's just an insult to wrestling, just like their segment last week in that dinner, debonair, whatever the hell they called it. And they did that little singing part. I know I didn't give my thoughts on it last week since I was leaf peeping, but I thought that segment last week, I went back and watched it. That was just a complete insult, and it was just a mockery of professional wrestling. Um, after it was then announced that Chris Jericho will face MJF, At full gear, if MJF defeats Jericho, then he will join the inner circle. I kind of have a feeling we might see MJF be the new leader of inner circle. Maybe the inner circle turns on Chris Jericho and makes MJF their leader. We'll see. I don't know. Just a thought. What did you think of this town hall meeting? It was not amusing to me. I remember I mentioned a few weeks ago, I said, geez, I think this is a a subtle (laughs) storyline. It's going to play out over a while, but boy, has it become overbooked and overpushed. I would not have put this up against Halloween Havoc on NXT. Uh, They might have thought it was fun because it was election season. I didn't see the fun in it. I did think it was great to see Eric Bischoff back on TV, although it may have been more fitting for Easy E to be over on Halloween Havoc, where he was involved in so many of those over the years. Um, They set up the Jericho-MJF match at Full Gear, which it could be a fine match to see if it gets him in the faction. Another one, stipulations, not my cup of tea. Like you just noted, I could see MGF winning and then taking over the inner circle where Jericho gets such a a babyface reaction, then have Jericho feud with the faction as a babyface. Then to overcomplicate it, overbook it, LAX says they're going to fight MJF and Wardlow next week on Dynamite to see if MJF can earn the match against Jericho at the pay-per-view it's too much book the match don't book the match too much too much i got that in my news and notes but we'll wait for that one yeah it was part of the show well usually when they do announcements i like to do it in the news and notes because it's not if it's not part if it's not part of the segment it was part of the segment no they announced it in the string of matches 
But LAX, or whatever they're called in the AEW, said they wanted MJF and Wardlow next week to see if MJF could earn the match against Jericho. That was during the town hall. Oh, it was? All right. I'll, yeah. I guess I'll oh, that's have... the only reason why I mentioned it. I know you like to save that for the end, for your big surprise. Well, no, usually when they announce matches for next week, I like to just put them in the news All notes right. in the well, bottom. You can do so it can, twice. How about that? We can go over them separately. Right. Cody defeated Orange Cassidy in the next match in a Lumberjack match to retain his TNT title. Um, I really don't think there's much left to say about Cassidy other than we really don't care for him and that we really don't think he's entertaining. To other people, he might be, but every week on the show, we butcher him. I mean, it's good for Orange Cassidy to get great spots like this, and many people like him, but I just can't enjoy him myself. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the guy personally. It's just the gimmick and the wrestling itself. It's just not for me. I know you've said stuff about him in the past. I mean, I don't know how many times we can go through it on the show. Um, the match ended with, obviously, everybody just brawling inside the ring because why not have everyone on the roster get their spots in every single week on AEW? I mean, anything Cody does, there has to be at least 15 to 20 people involved, um, whether it's ringside or running from the back and people fighting in the ring and uh, just all over the place to end the match, which in the first place I really didn't care about. Uh, what did you think about this match and the brawl after? Oh, well, you know, I thought before the match, the Team Taz promo on Will Hobbs joining their faction was a, a much better 30 seconds than what came afterwards. And this, after the embarrassment last week, I would have had Cody win in about 45 seconds. Good effort by both guys. I think Cody could make Reno Chastain look good going 20 minutes, but this was not something I wanted to see from Cody Rhodes again against a guy that puts his hands in his pockets. To me, it's not fun. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's nothing I ever want to see again. I don't know Orange Cassidy, the human being. He might be a fine human being, but he brings me no joy in watching wrestling. And then on top of it, you have the big undercard schmaz with a bunch of guys whose names I didn't even know that I had no interest in seeing after a match I didn't want to see. How about that for my thoughts on the TNT title match? Good. Almost, we usually have the same thoughts, which I like. Yeah. The next segment, Miro and Kip Sabian took out Trent and Chucky e. T backstage. This is exactly how AEW should be using Miro. Destroying people, going after people physically, no jokes, no stupid comments, no joke promos, no playing video games at ringside. Go into a locker room and beat the shit out of someone. Don't have them playing video games at ringside and getting mad when people break the machine. Don't have them wearing Disney outfits in the ring and sneakers and sweatpants. Have them look like a badass who could beat the shit out of people in the ring, ringside, backstage, anywhere. This is how they should be using him, not as a goof. Well, no, I disagree because I still think he was used as a goof. He had on his stupid floral shorts. They teased friendship with best friends. Then they did have a brawl where at least he looked like he was a man that could physically assault someone. But what was well, it yeah. over? It was, an, it was a, a, a still a vendetta over a broken piece of an arcade game. I mean, I'm just saying they on. used him right, though. It was they better, don't... but it still sucked. Yeah. Better, as I, better, as I said. The next match, Serena Deeb defeated Layla Hirsch to retain her NWA women's title. Oh, that's a big uh, the women's title for the NWA, I think, has been showcased more than the AEW women's title in recent months. Um, Serena Deeb is the new champion after she beat uh, Thunder Rosa, I believe it was Tuesday night. Um, so, yeah, Believe it or not, I missed that one. Yeah, Not much to say about this one. I mean, it's two women that I... I, re I mean, none of the women I really care for, but this could have been done without in the show. I mean, they've this sh title has been defended multiple times on Dynamite, and it's not even part of the company. I mean, maybe we'll see a unification of the AEW and NWA women's titles. I don't know. I mean, they're just showcasing these NWA women's titles uh, so much that I, I don't know what they're trying to do. What did you think of the match, if anything at all? Why are the fans supposed to care about NWA titles when AEW has their own titles? The match was fine. I just thought it was way too long for two wrestlers the fans aren't that familiar with or invested in. I thought it was a waste of time. But 
Next. Like I said, I'm going to be kind for Halloween. That's going to be my costume. Sean Spears defeated uh, VSK. Um, in a alphabet very, very soup. A lot match. of alphabet soup in that company, too, but VSK. Um, VSK I've worked a few events with. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah, what do we got? What, what do you think is longer, my socks or that match? The socks. The socks, okay. Um, after the match, Scorpio Sky hit Spears with a TKO. After being disguised in a costume at ringside, after he was talking shit to yeah, Sean Spears a, during the match. That, Sean was, that Spears, was a big fucking surprise right there. That one of those people under the uh, the masks at ringside was going to turn out to be one of the, the wrestlers involved in a vendetta. They, they didn't telegraph that at all, but... He threw him inside. The, I guess he took him from ringside, put him inside the ring, and he took the mask off, and then him with the TKO. I very telegraphed, felt very just just boring. I guess to set up another match between the two, which we will get into in the news and notes. I, I, I the, certainly will not disrupt this one for you, sir. Please, no. And then in the main event, Kenny Omega defeated Penta L Zero M to advance to the finals of the number one contenders tournament for the AEW title. Omega will face off against Hangman Adam Page at full gear in the finals to see who will face the AEW champion. After that, this finals matchup was just very obvious once they announced who was going to be in the tournament. But it'll still be entertaining and a very good match that many people have been wanting. Um... What did you think about the main event? I thought it was a pretty solid match. I thought it was a pretty solid match, but again, here's what gets me. Omega gets hit with a Canadian destroyer on the ramp. Then seconds later is hit with a pile driver in the ring and still kicks out at two and three quarters like it's WrestleMania. I mean, there's a reason why WrestleMania finishes are remembered for decades and TV shows like this are forgotten before the next episode. Overdone spots, but a nice outing from Omega. And uh, M, I don't know, <laughs> is that how you're supposed to refer to him now? Just by the letter, or? Just call him... M? <laughs> well, the initials are P-E-Z-M, so you can call him Pez. Well, you know what, I'm not... A, I am a fan of Pez, as is little Marathi. I usually try and throw a little Pez into his Christmas stocking each year. But. Well, the Pez headquarters are only 10 minutes down the street from Degnan Estates. Well, so. that, that, that Milford, Connecticut, I tell you, it's nonstop. Got everything here. Uh, we'll go into our grades for AEW. I thought AEW was a little bit less kind of equal. Both, both of the shows were like, you always grill me for doing halves, but I really think both shows were about a five and a half. I know you don't like doing that, no. but they were both around a five or a six. Not when you I, have ten numbers to work with, brother. Yeah. Um, I thought they were both in between a five and a six, so I was kind of seesawing back and forth with each one. Um, but I gave AEW a five out of ten. I well, thought it was middle of the road. Um, it just Some of it took away from the show more than it added. I think really the only positives to this show was the opening match and the closing match. Everything else in between you can really do without, and that's why I gave it less than NXT. I, like you, gave this one a five. There were a couple of good matches. I was always happy to see Eric Bischoff. There was some stupidity, so I meet in the middle. I give both shows a five this week because there was nothing at the end of the day that I would really ever want to see again. Nothing that was really too... Well, you know what? There were some things on Halloween Havoc that really did suck, but maybe I was too kind with them. But to me, they were both fives. There were some nice efforts on both shows, and there were some disasters on both shows. And But at least there was no MJF and Chris Jericho singing and dancing. So it was yeah. a, a much improved episode from last week for me. AEW made some announcements for next week. Big uh, announcements. Dynamo big announcements. Dynamite. Ortiz and Santana will face MJF and Wardlow. Miro will face Trent. Sean Spears will face Scorpio Sky. Cody and the Gun Club will face the Dark Order. Woo. AEW champion John Moxley and Eddie Kingston will go face-to-face -face before their big title match at Full Gear next Saturday. And Chris Jericho will be on commentary for this Dynamite next Wednesday. Um... This is a pretty quick Wednesday one, I th well, think, because 
And you missed in the news and notes section on the uh, the ever rapidly growing AEW Doc program online on Tuesday nights. Um, apparently, this week they've only booked eighty two matches, so they've cut down a little. Oh, bit. Did you hear how long Dino <laughs> or Dark one? I know it's in the teens. It's got to the point now where it's in the teens every week as far as how many matches they have. I have never watched AEW Doc other than the one time I was at it live, but I don't know how I don't know how long of a show it is that they have that many matches. Well, if you take the commercials away from Raw, it's about the same amount of time. <laughs> Do you watch AEW Doc? I watched a few episodes. How long is it? A, usually the first couple ones were about an hour to an hour and a half recently they've been doing two hours to two and a half i don't know if it was this week but sometime recently i think there were like 15 matches on one of them i saw the the, the the list somewhere on twitter the past couple weeks have been like that and they've been two hours to two and a half hours of just enhancement and jobber matches and it's it's insane how you but the thing is there's no promos there's no commercials. It's just match, 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 one after another. And there's just, it's way too long. I don't know how people can just sit through enhancement matches like that, but I guess they you can know, do you it. You the want. 80s, I guess. I don't know. No, but th- when it's just, I, now, You know what? Now I'm almost at the point where I want to watch it just to see what it's like once. When the show, uh, uh, for two and a half hours of enhancement matches, just back to back to back to back, just the whole show, it it bores me. I only watched a few. Unless they announce a match that involves someone I know or someone I particularly care for, I could really care less about that show. But Well, and to me, it's been dark since its inception. As I said, I've never watched it other than the one time um, when they were at, where were they? Again, a Serena in Boston. I was there, so it kind of made sense to watch it. But I, I am mystified by the, the total number of matches on one show. It's almost, it was almost like WrestleMania four when they had the championship tournament that went on forever. When I saw the list, I don't again, I don't know if it was this week specifically, but I think there were fifteen matches on a recent episode. And I was like, wow, that, that that's gotta be a pretty long show. No. I don't know. You know what's gonna be a good show though? Next Thursday night at 8 p.m. when recent WWE NXT Grizzaway champion Leo Rush joins us as we tape our Wrestling Insider Rush Hour miniseries along with that cyber autograph signing as part of the ninth annual Paul Bear Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive. For complete information, head on over to bostonwrestling.com. Is that what you were referring to or something else? Yes. Oh, you are? Okay, mul- good, good. That and the multitude of other superstars we'll be having in studio in November and December. A plethora. Plethora, I a guess. plethora, and I, I don't want to ruin anything for anyone because we did run into a technical hiccup with our raw review this week. But that entire roster may be available as we speak on Boston Wrestle Media, Boston Media, on BostonWrestling.com, and across our social media platforms. But I don't want to spoil it just in case. Just in case. No, we'll we'll wait for the big announcements. But from November 5th through December 13th, you may as well reside here, kid. It's going to be a happening. Maybe I'll rent an apartment for a month. No, I don't know about that. You have to go over the little Dutch boy from Holland's. Maybe I'll have to move into Marathi Hill. Uh, There's only room for one on that hill, baby. (laughs) It's a cold, dark, evil place, old Marathi Hill. Even during Halloween. Even during it. You know, it's Halloween now, year-round on Marathi Hill. Now, will you be handing out candy? Uh, no. No. I no. have uh, never handed out candy. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, when was the last time you trick-or-treated? 1993. <laughs> it was a week. It's funny enough. It was the day after Cecil the Lion was born. Cecil, one of our associates here at the MWF that recently threatened my life. Uh, I think as I described to you over the the smartphone that was hooked up to a, a car radio and his threatening of my life reverberated through the car. <laughs> he was born October 30th, 1993. It was actually eight days after my first day in pro wrestling, which would have been October 23rd, 1993. I actually, for the final time, I went and trick-or-treated as the Jackal, who was the... Uh, 
voice of the Century Wrestling Alliance for Tony Rumble. And I'm going to guess I was the, the only person in 1993 <laughs> dressed as the Jackal for Halloween. I'm going to guess that I may have been the only person in the history of mankind dressed as the Jackal for Halloween. But that is who I was. Well, I'm trying to think of the last time I trick-or-treated. I haven't trick-or-treated in a while. I used to love to wait for the kids to go to bed to sneak through their bags and hustle a few. <laughs> you know, sometimes you find things in there you don't usually get throughout the year, like those little mini boxes of nerds and smarties. You know, usually I, I don't have those often, and, you know, I, I, I'm i not ashamed to say I stole them from the children. They oh, didn't need you, that much sugar. If you were going to dress up this year, who would you dress up as? If I was going to dress up as someone for Halloween this year, who would I dress up as? Now, if I was a kid or if I was going to a Halloween party at my age now? Right now. Is 40-year-old Dan Marotti, who the heck would I go dressed up as for for Halloween? Dr. Deborah Burks. <laughs> I'd get a nice, cup, nice colored scarf. Cupcake Thousand? No, I I'm not that good of a dancer. No. No. <laughs> but it would or be wonderful. It be it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. You know wonderful. who I might dress up as? Who would you be? The lovely Maria Davis. Well, I don't think uh, you can touch such beauty with a Halloween well, costume. You can only try. Unless maybe you were going to to make it a little easier wear a Pittsburgh Steelers football helmet, then the face well, would be kind of hidden. I I do have a Steelers jersey. A family friend of ours used to play for them, so I, I have his Christmas jersey from a couple years oh, ago. Really? That's signed by him. Yeah, it's signed by him too. Well, well, maybe Maria will be headed up to Milford. I don't know. Well, maybe she could sign it too, and I'll wear that for Halloween. Well, they, you and Maria could go together as two Steelers. No, she then could you could uh, say, Maria, I'll steal your hot kid. Well, that's that's one way to put it. I know Lawson attempts to, but that's a different story. <laughs> a different time. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, I tell you. You know, you know what's disappointing? So We're recording this so early this week. Uh, Quincy's not going to be able to do his run-in because he usually comes a little later than this. I was very happy to get into the studio early to do a little uh, ninth annual Holiday Headlocks prep work. So we decided to do the podcast a little early, but we're not going to get the Quincy running. You'll have to wait until next week. Although next week, I don't even know what we're going to do for AEW because we're going to have Leo. What time do, oh, What time does he come? He's going to be an all-dayer. So oh, we may have unless, to do that yeah. on Friday. We may have unless, to be a day late. Unless I come early. No, he, he, when I say he's coming early, he's coming pretty early. Like what time? Well, we can't discuss that on the air. We don't, we don't need people hanging at the airport with stacks of 8 by 10s waiting to be signed. Unless I do it, we record it on my drive up from the WFAN mobile. I don't know what I'd record it on at that point. We'll figure it out. We may just have to do it a day late, that's all. Well, it'll be our, maybe <laughs> I don't I don't want to say it, but there's a solution yeah, to every problem. Yeah. Well, you could take us out, brother. All right, wrestling fans, let us know what you thought of AEW. Let us know what you thought of NXT on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best. Leave it in the premiere if you're chatting along with us Thursday night at 10 p.m. or in the comment section below if you're not joining us live. For my good friend from southwestern Connecticut, Matt Degnan, this is Dan Marotti. We'll see you. Right after the Thunderdome, when it comes to a close tomorrow night, John Cena Sr.'s Dome just gets started, and he's going to talk a little Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, Roman Reigns, Jey Uso, and more. Till we speak again, folks, you and yours. Be well, stay healthy. Good night. Wrestling fans, our ninth annual Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive is kicking off with an early, unexpected bang as recent WWE NXT Cruiserweight Champion Leo Rush will be joining us live Thursday, November the 5th here at MWF Studios in downtown Melrose, Massachusetts, the zip code of champion 02176. A lot has been said about Leo while he was with WWE. A lot has been said about Leo since he was released by WWE during the coronavirus 
outbreak in April. We'll be taping a special Wrestling Insider Rush Hour miniseries to let Leo tell his story his way. At 8 p.m. that night, we'll be going live around the corner and around the world for a special cyber autograph signing where you can get a personalized autograph photo from Leo sent directly to your home. For complete information, visit bostonwrestling.com.